My name is Henry James Burley Smith. Uh, I'm 92 and I'm living in uh, Coconut Grove, Florida. I was fortunate enough uh, in 1950 to be the uh, junior third mate on the Meredith Victory, a vessel that was lucky enough to be involved in the Incheon invasion, the Hungnam evacuation in Korea, where we helped rescue and on our own ship loaded 14,000 North Korean refugees uh, who were about to be engulfed by the Chinese and the North Korean forces. I applied to the Merchant Marine Academy in 1946 because I couldn't afford to go to college. Um, my dad had been an ordinary seaman and an able seaman all during the war, uh, sailing on Liberty ships out of New York. So I knew of the Merchant Marine, and through my father had heard about the Merchant Marine Academy, and took the examination in April of 1946 up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and passed. And that's how I ended up at uh, San Mateo in California at the Merchant Marine Basic Cadet School. During the war, um, the federal cadet program had basic schools uh, in Great Neck, San Mateo, California, and Pass Christian, Mississippi. I spent my first year as a fourth classman down at San Mateo, just south of San Francisco. We were the last class to go through, and then everybody went to Kings Point for their basic year, right. then a year at sea, then two more years at Kings Point. I graduated from Kings Point, the Merchant Marine Academy in Great Neck on Long Island, in June of 1950. My first assignment during Kings Point was a year with American President Line sailing on round-the-world freighter. It was supposed to be a three-month trip, but because it was right after the war and the harbor in Genoa was still a disaster because of the bomb damage and the containers hadn't been invented, so when it rained in Penang, we were stuck for 10 days because we couldn't get enough tents to cover our open hatches to work cargo. And um, so a three-month trip turned into a six-month trip. Um, then after a round-the-world trip with American president on a C-4 freighter, that trip, uh, they took pity on me and put me on a brand-new passenger ship, uh, the President Cleveland out of San Francisco. And I made several trips to the Orient as a cadet on the President Cleveland before going back to Kings Point for my sophomore, for my junior year at Kings Point. In June of 1950, must have been about June 15th that we got out of the academy, and uh, I went down to Atlantic City where my home was at that time and drove a taxi cab for a few weeks waiting for my first assignment to go to sea. And on June 25th, about a week or two after we graduated, the Korean War started. So suddenly there was quite a lot of demand. I had uh, thought that where I wanted to go to sea would be down to the east coast of South America with Moore McCormick Line. And Mormack also sailed over to Scandinavia so I could see myself in the Baltic and Stockholm and, and along the coast of those countries. And uh, I had a call, so I'd registered with Mormack in New York while I was driving my taxi. And I got a call from Mormack Cormack saying, hey, we've got a ship for you. And I thought, great, I'm off to Rio. And in fact, what they said was, the ship we're assigning you to is one called the Meredith Victory. And it's down in the boneyard at the, uh, not the boneyard, but the reserve fleet in the James River in Norfolk, Virginia. Meredith was my first job as an officer on a ship, and I was assigned as junior third mate. Uh, that's the mate of the 8 to 12 watch on an American ship. And um, my duties were to run the bridge from 8 to 12 in the morning and 8 to 12 at night. It felt very natural because having spent a year as a cadet, um, working with the mates on the different watches. I knew what each of the mates did on their watches and how the watches ran. 
So it was really a very comfortable thing. Uh, we had a chief mate who was a bit of a martinet, a tough guy. Sevastio was not easy to work with. But the skipper, uh, with whom we spent most of our time when you were a, a mate on watch on the bridge, um, Captain LaRue on the Merit of Victory was a very uh, relaxed, easygoing, great fellow to work with. We had been running in Korea, the um, Merit of the Victory had been running back and forth between Yokohama and Pusan, or Yokohama and Incheon, with supplies for the American forces. Uh, we were in, in mid-December, uh, about December 15th, we arrived in uh, Pusan, or Busan as they now call it, uh, with a cargo of um, mainly aviation fuel in 55-gallon drums and other general war materials. This is what we'd been doing for the six months that we were in Korea. And we had most of the cargo unloaded when the Chinese incursion up in the north, after the Chinese came in across the Yellow River and pushed MacArthur's troops, General Allman's army and marine group, back from the reservoir, uh, they knew that our people were going to be trapped at the coast up at Hungnam on the east coast of Korea. And so suddenly the word was, get all the ships you can up to Hangnam so we can get these 98, 100,000, there were estimated to be 100,000 US military and Turkish and Canadian and British military who were allies of ours fighting alongside us uh, off the beaches. So uh, we were suddenly ordered from Pusan to sail up to Hangnam where they expected us to start loading war materials. We arrived up in Hangnam on uh, December 22nd and at this point most of the military had already been embarked. They were just holding several lines around the port by the last of the Marines and the Army. Uh, these lines were about two to three miles inland. We could actually see the fires of the Chinese on the hilltops around the port at night. They were so close. Uh, one of our crew members who's been often quoted uh, by, by the press said that Captain LaRue was asked if he would take aboard refugees instead of cargo. And, uh, my, my recollection is not at all that way. As a merchant ship on charter to the military, I don't think we were asked. We were told we've got a lot of Korean, North Korean civilians that we want to get out of here. Will you take them? Any problem? And one of the reports I've read um, by one of our crewmates said that the officers were called together and we discussed whether we would take the civilians. That's complete, completely erroneous. Uh, we were, we simply were told, go alongside. We berthed next to the Nor Cuba, which I think was a Liberty ship. Uh, she was already lying at the dock there and um, began loading these, something like a total of 98,000 is the estimate of Korean refugees that were taken out. We took uh, 14,000 on our ship. It's estimated that at least as many of the North Korean refugees were left on the uh, on land there, another 90,000 or so who never did get saved. We had not quite finished discharging down in Busan when we were ordered up to uh, Hungnam. So in number, if I, my memory serves, number three lower hold and I think number two lower hold possibly, uh, we still had several tiers of 55 gallon drums of aviation fuel, JP-4 I think they called it. So there was still some cargo in the lower holds, only the fuel in drums. We kept the, hat, the lower holds that, were, that had the drums in them, we kept them with the hatchboards on so they theoretically couldn't get in. But of course during the voyage we found that they had crawled down the ladders into the lower hold and they'd been lighting little fires on top of these drums of fuel to, to warm their whatever tea water they had. That's the most remarkable thing, I think, about the whole adventure, that there weren't any remarkable things happening. Uh, these people were all crammed on the dock. Remember, it was sort of a mass of white 
light-colored winter clothing that these people had been wearing, coming down through the snow for weeks, uh, terrible freezing weather. It was really horrible. All the crew, all of us had traded booze or cigarettes for army jackets and things. That's the only thing that kept us from freezing. But these people had arrived on the dock and were carrying babies. There were old folk. There were some young folk. Um, they were just as quiet and well-behaved. You couldn't believe it. There was no noise coming from them. I don't think any of us ever heard a baby cry. It was the most remarkable thing because there were hundreds and hundreds of very young children in, on the backs of these uh, refugees. There was no pushing, there was no shoving. I've often said, talking to people about this, that if it had been a, a group of, of uh, Cubans, a group of Frenchmen, some of my own ancestors from the south of France, uh, there would have been chaos on the docks, people scrambling to get to the ship. There was none of this. They waited patiently, they waited calmly, they did exactly as we indicated they should do. All of us, we'd broken watches, so the mates were all, all working the decks, and our, the boys were working the winches, our, our deck gang were work, working our own winches because we were bringing some of them aboard with our own cargo gear on big wooden pallets that had been built on the dock. And uh, no, there were no interpreters. There might have been some interpreters that we never knew about who were with the captain. But on deck and in the holds, they were just coming aboard. The military was funneling them to the ship's side. Uh, no, there was no discussion. They were piling in. I, I can remember, you know, I'm down in the lower holds. Uh, in whatever hatch I was working, and we knew that we had to get as many as possible on. So all I was doing, and I'm sure the other mates doing the same, as they would land on these pallets in the center of the uh, hatch, on whatever deck we were working, that we'd get them off, they would just naturally step off the wooden pallet, and we'd have them move over into the wings, the dark wings, make them stand. We didn't let them sit until the last pallet had had room to land in the middle, then we would, they were still all standing, so we'd get maximum people. And then we would put the beams and the hatchboards on and fill the next deck and the next deck. There were 13 decks all together that we filled. It took about 15 hours. Uh, we started loading about midday and finished uh, early the next morning. We knew that the enemy was right there because we could see their fires. Uh, the only noise and excitement was coming from the American jets that were napalming the Chinese. You could see those during the daylight hours as they were coming down, dropping their napalm and firing at them. And the Missouri and I think maybe Iowa were offshore. Rochester was offshore, the cruiser, out of sight. We couldn't see them, but they were lobbing the... Uh, Missouri was lobbing these 16-inch shells right over our heads because to hit the Chinese on the beach, it was such a short distance that they were coming over at about a thousand feet or so, I would imagine, of altitude. And instead of shrieking, it sounded like trains, big express trains coming overhead as these shells went toward the beach. So there was lots of noise and excitement. My classmate Merle Smith, who was on the ship with me, the engineer, he and I have talked about this so often. It was all very much this is the job today. We Remember, we'd done the Incheon invasion. We'd been back and forth uh, to Korea many times. The weather had been horrible. It was just another day in the life on the merit of the victory by this point. The one thing, thinking back on it, that we might have been concerned about, but there was nothing we could have done about it, was that as we steamed out through the minefield, as LaRue, the skipper, said later, he said, you know, I felt the hand of God was on my on the rudder going out through the minefield with 14,000 people because in those frigid Arctic waters, if, if we'd hit a mine, and they say it was one of the largest minefields ever laid, and of course 14,000 people would have died. We had two lifeboats, each with 150 capacity. If any five or six of the refugees had walked up to the bridge, because there were no barriers, they could walk anywhere they wanted to, they tended not to come up to the upper decks. Merle said the only thing he ever saw of any of them near his room was at night when some of them would put a hand through the window with a little cup trying to get some water because they had no water, they had no food, they had no toilets. The feces that we took out when we finally got to Sasebo to clean the ship before we came home were 
four feet tall in each corner of each hatch. It was incredible. We didn't know where we were going. We had no instructions. We had no radio. So after the flashing light and we left uh, Hung Nam, we went to Pusan because that's where the only place we knew we'd be received. And that was 300 mi miles, about a 30-hour, uh, yeah, about a day and a half run. We got down there and the military said, you know, what on earth is this? Where are you going? Who are you? What have you got on board? And um, they made us anchor and we, we just sat there and they were afraid to let us come alongside because of the plague, of course, by this time. And finally they decided because they, these refugees had been without food, without water, without light, without air down in the holes, they figured they had to bring us alongside to put some food on board. So they let us dock for about 12 hours, eight, eight hours maybe, and they brought aboard GI cans full of boiled rice and they took as much of that in their hands as they could, fed themselves, and then they shooed us out, wouldn't let any of us go ashore. And then they sent us down to this hastily prepared prison island, Kojido, uh, where they were putting the North Korean prisoners of war, the army people, the Chinese, anybody they captured, and plus the refugees. As these 14,000, obviously many of them women, and many of them pregnant, um, as the first ones began to deliver, Sevastio, the chief mate, um, would bring them up if he knew in time, and presumably a midwife or so from the 14,000 would come with him. And one of the geniuses on the ship, one of our crew, must have said the only word we knew in Korean was kimchi, so they named the first one Kimchi One. And by the time we got to Koji Island, where we discharged them, there had been five. So there, kimchi one and five, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Kimchi one and f I think four and five have come to visit us when we go over on the trips that we've made since then. There are pictures of them you'll see online if you just go into the Meredith Victory. And um, they're, they're now all in their, well, let's see, they'd be all in their 80s. I, I, when I learned a couple of years back that President Moon's parents had been refugees on the ship, I wrote to him and I said, I've just discovered that your mother and father were young refugees. And they would have been in their early 20s because his mother, who just died a year ago, was a year older than I, so she must have been 22 at the time. And I wrote to the president and I said, <laughs> I said, you'd be interested to know that your mother and father and I were on a cruise together back in 1950. <laughs> and I got this wonderful letter back from him uh, with a picture of him and his wife and uh, saying that his mother, uh, who at that point was still alive, had the most wonderful memories of <laughs> the ship, the Merit of Victory, because she said she remembers one of the soldiers giving out a little, the expression he used was cute, little uh, candy droplets to the refugees. So all I can imagine, since we had no soldiers on board, was one of the crew must have been to one or two, I mean, how many candy droplets can you give out to 14,000 people? I've been back about four times, not every year, no. The, uh, the Koreans love to have us come, and of course, as soon as you appear, or they know you're coming. Um, President Moon has been wonderful, of course, having his mother be one of the refugees. He's very much involved and was very appreciative of uh, the whole thing. When you go to Korea, you realize how important it is. When you see the size and the importance of the monument to the ship down on Koji Island, Koji-do, um, when you see the amount of interest and uh, the thankfulness of the people when you're there, because they say there are over a million descendants of the 98,000 refugees who were rescued. And uh, many of them who were rescued, of course, never had any contact with their family back home from whom they were separated. But yes, Korea celebrates this in a tremendous fashion. I think to the rest of us, um, probably the next 30 or 40 years were it was a historical fact, it had been exciting, we were very pleased to have been part of it, but it wasn't something that we were focused on. I know it gave 
all of us a feeling of tremendous admiration for the Korean people. That's, I think, the paramount thing that sticks in the mind, that how these people could have suffered for so long to behave as well as in such a civilized manner as they did. It made us admire them tremendously. Um, the only time it began to focus on us, I think, certainly in Merle Smith's case, in my case, was in the last 20 years when the world began to realize what had happened at Hung Nam. They call Korea the Forgotten War because most of our kids know nothing about it at all. As I say, just admiration for the Korean people, I think, is, is the overwhelming sentiment that I have. The majority, the vast majority of Americans have no idea what the Merchant Marine is. They don't know whether it's an arm of the military. They don't know uh, who the people are that man ships. I don't see how the United States or any other major country could support a foreign war without a Merchant Marine. It's absolutely essential. Let the sea roll high or low. We can cross any ocean, sail any river, give us the girth and we'll deliver. Damn the submarine, we're the men of the merchant marine.